On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling him. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and were not allowed anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, It is not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Is it not, excuse me, is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. Have faith in God, Jesus told them. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Creator in heaven may forgive your offenses. Here is the reading. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and redeemer. I can still remember one of the first times that I was moved to tears in church. I was a teenager in Des Moines, Iowa, and our youth group was trying to convince the church to open a homeless shelter and to be part of welcoming and serving the homeless. But we were told there were not sufficient funds for us to take on such a new ministry and all the costs associated with it. You can imagine my excitement one day when I heard the pastor announced that the church had received a million dollar donation. Wow. Yet that turned to dismay shortly after when he explained that well, it was actually a matching donation, so we had to raise the other million dollars. And then, when we received two million dollars and had raised that, it must be used to purchase a new organ. Our church already had an organ, and it was known for organ recitals, and yet they wanted, they wanted the one that was the best, and it wouldn't be able to be used for our ministry. I felt so frustrated that I felt like running down and overturning the tables where we were giving our collections. And yet, I wasn't really sure if that was the right thing for me to do. And I can tell you, even today, if I were to do something that dramatic here in this church, you might run me out of the temple. <laughs> but since today we haven't taken collections and we're not trying to raise money for an organ, I'll stare you at the theater. But Jesus, Jesus didn't hesitate to use dramatic actions, symbolic actions, that would shake things up in order to stay true to the faith. In today's reading, we hear that Jesus and his disciples went into Jerusalem, they went into the temple, and they threw out those who were changing money in the temple. They overturned the benches where the doves were used for sacrifice, and it was really a symbolic action, but really what Jesus was doing was almost a form of civil disobedience. They went into the temple, overturned things, and what did he do once they had gotten the attention of people? He started teaching. It was really kind of a, a teaching, you might say. And once he began teaching, he started speaking and telling the people who were gathered that have faith in God. If you believe truly in your hearts, you could say to this mountain, get up and throw yourselves into the sea. Biblical scholars suggest that when Jesus said this mountain, he was pointing perhaps to the Herodium, which was the great palace of Herod that was up on a hill overlooking Jerusalem, and it was a symbol of the oppression of the Roman rule 
that was subjugating the Israeli people. So Jesus was telling them to have faith that this sort of mountains could be moved. And yet, he was speaking to his disciples and he also said, it's not enough just to move external mountains. We must begin with the internal mountains in our own hearts. He spoke of forgiveness and the power of forgiveness when we're in prayer as the first thing in order to move those sort of mountains. So today I'd like to lift up with you some of the symbolic actions that have been taken by this very church that have moved mountains throughout the denomination and throughout our greater society. Back in the 70s, there was a group of women in this church, some of whom are with us today, who were concerned that the language and the liturgy and the images on the bulletins and in the hymns were not representing women, were not showing women in leadership within the church. And they decided to take a symbolic action. They wrote up a list of demands called the 9.5 Thesis, and they nailed it to the church door in the tradition of Martin Luther. Now this was a symbolic action, of course, but it did get some significant press, and it had a ripple effect. It had a ripple effect throughout the denomination that eventually led to the creation of the New Century Hymnal. And if you look at the hymnal in your, uh, in your pew, on the introduction, page 10 of the introduction, it explains that there was a feeling that the language of patriarchy that had been infused into the faith tradition was not speaking to our generation. And so that had a dramatic effect. This is a, a hymnal that's now used by congregations outside even the United Church of Christ that want to have a more inclusive message. Another symbolic action taken by this church was to be a church that would welcome and provide a radical welcome to those who had special needs, those who were differently able, to make them welcome and not excluded from our worship. Now that symbolic action also had ripple effects that led the UCC to adopting, it contributed to adopting a policy of being accessible to all, which is really dramatic to offer that kind of ministry. Another symbolic action that this church has taken was to go through a process of reflection and to decide to be open and affirming. This is a symbolic action that some may have perceived as a risk that could divide the church or perhaps lead people not to come, but the contrary has been true. We have seen growth in the years since this church has become open and affirming and welcomed those who are often excluded and rejected from other churches. So you can see symbolic actions can have a tremendous impact. I'd like to share with you about a symbolic action that is happening at the end of this week, on this upcoming Friday. There's a group of workers at the Pomona College who for years have been struggling to improve the working conditions in the dining halls. They're the lowest paid workers in the school, and they've been involved with efforts with the support of students and community groups trying to bring a change in their workplace. But they've found themselves up against a pretty strong mountain. And in December of this year, just weeks before Christmas, the Board of Trustees and the President of Pomona College fired 15 workers after doing a review and audit, an internal audit that was not required by any state or federal law of the work authorization of its employees. And they fired those workers. But rather than being discouraged, these workers have decided that on this Friday, Cesar Chavez Day, they are going to host a banquet in the streets. They are going to, in the spirit of Jesus, say that we are determined to continue serving our community. We want to serve the students, we want to serve the administration that we have for years, and we're going to do it in the streets. So I'll be there with the mariachi group. It's going to be quite a festive occasion, and you're all invited to join us at the banquet. Now I realize, I recognize that not 
everyone shares the same perspective on immigration or on issues related to how to make improvements in the workplace. And I think this is a situation where we can believe and aspire to build a community of faith where those who are immigrant workers and those who are university presidents can be reconciled. Jesus shows us that through the power of love, we can experience transformation. We can experience reconciliation. And that is our hope in the situation in Pomona. Now, I recognize also that oftentimes, when we're trying to create a change of an external mountain, it has to begin with an internal change. And more often than not, it has been my own internal mountains that have kept me from connecting with those who I would like to be in solidarity. I'll share you a story from my own personal life. A few years back, during the summer, I went to Iowa in order to visit my grandfather. He was 89 years old at the time, and he wanted to introduce me to his new lady friend, who he was spending time with after his second wife had passed. So I flew to Iowa, and as we were talking, I was sharing with them about the work that I was doing, serving the poor, helping and advocating for immigrants, and I showed them pictures. Rather than receiving affirmation in that moment, the response that I got from his friend was, well, are any of those immigrants illegals? And it kind of made me bristle. I started to get defensive. I felt compelled to kind of start debating, and I said, well, we're both people of faith. Don't you know that in the Bible it says that we must welcome the immigrant, we must welcome the stranger? And yet, with that approach, it wasn't really building much of a connection between us. And I have to admit, at one point I left the room and came back, and it made my grandfather very uncomfortable. The last thing that he wanted in his community was to have a conflict or a controversy. So when I went home to Iowa, I felt, I felt conflicted in my heart. And since I had a custom of prayer, at the end of the day, I sat in prayer and I realized that I was building a mountain of resentment towards my grandfather and towards his friend, and that was keeping me from connecting with him. Now sometimes I can endure a certain amount of resentment in a relationship, but when it's your grandfather, and he's 89 years old, I knew I needed to be reconciled with him because every visit that I made could be my last. And so in my heart, I knew I had to make an amends. I picked up the phone, and I called my grandpa, and after the normal pleasantries, I said, Grandpa, there's something I want to share with you. I want to apologize for creating a conflict in your community. I'm sorry that I got into a debate about immigration that made you and your friend uncomfortable. I want you to know that I don't want anything to stand between us because you're the only grandpa I've ever had. You've always been there for me, and I love you. That was a powerful experience for me. That sharing began to move a mountain. He thanked me, and a week later I got a call from my grandpa, and he said that he and his friend had been talking, and they wanted to come visit me and my sister in Iowa. He had never, I mean, he wanted to come to California to visit me and my sister, and he had never come to California to visit me in the 10 years I had been out here. So next thing you know, my grandpa, who's 89, and his late friend, was in her late 80s also, got on an Amtrak train, and they traveled out to California. So on my birthday, I took the both of them out to the best Mexican restaurant in town. <laughs> and I had a surprise for them, because when the mariachi came out, I came out with the mariachi too, and brought a serenade to their table. So at the end, we had a picture of me with my grandparents, surrounded by the smiling faces of a mariachi, 
And when they went back to their community, they had a picture that they shared with all of their friends. This is my grandson. And look how he's singing with my watches. That was the experience in my life that gives me faith that it's possible to move mountains. If we begin with our internal mountains, it can start to move the external mountains that keep us from celebrating together. So with that example, I know that we are called in this church to continue taking symbolic actions that will welcome more people to experience God's love. And one of the most bold and significant actions taken by this church has been to launch Aspire Ministries. We are announcing to the world that we are aspiring to move mountains that keep people from coming and worshiping together. We are aspiring to create a type of worship community that will draw people in in the new generation. And together, I believe that we must aspire to create a welcome in this church that continues to welcome and be open and affirming so that my sister, who has known that she is gay since she came out in high school, can feel welcome and not judged. She can worship as she is. I want to aspire to build a church where my beautiful fiance, Elizabeth, who is Mexican-American, is free to celebrate and to worship in a multicultural, multiracial, and multilingual church that will honor her cultural heritage. We also must aspire to build a church that is accessible to all, so that my fiance's brother, who has Down syndrome, is not excluded from the worship, but is invited to be present. We must continue aspiring to build a church that is advocating for a just peace, so that future generations do not have to grow up in a world that is consumed with perpetual war. I invite you all to join us as we build a church that is aspiring to be welcoming to the immigrant, so that we can create a house of worship true to Jesus' call, where we can pray for all the nations, together as all the nations. And finally, we must aspire to create a church that is theologically diverse, so that each of us has the opportunity to experience the still-speaking God and to worship together in the language that most speaks to us. I believe that it's possible for us to move this mountain. And as I close today, I'd like to lift up the words of a poem by Elizabeth Hoden. She writes that there is a fire in our hearts that is capable of lighting the night. There is a purpose that guides our hearts and souls. Follow it with delight. And when, at the end of the day, you rest, Remember these words and become your best. Aspire to inspire, my parents would say. Brighten your world every day.